research with you. It's about craft for social change. I'll tell you a bit about me. I'm not a designer. My background isn't design. I did a business studies degree and did my master's in fashion business. And then went into industry and uh, went into banking and spent years in banking and in commerce and came back into the fashion industry. Um, and I came to MMU um, where I studied and now I'm the course leader for fashion business and management. So that's my background and what I'm hoping to do is to really translate the knowledge that we have in business into fashion and into the craft sector. Now craft is an absolute passion of mine because I was born in Sri Lanka, I spent much of my life in Nigeria growing up and I've experienced so many textile markets there with my mum who used to sew for me all the time. So, so that's where my real passion for craft has come. And whilst I was there and when I see myself today, I recognise how privileged we are when you're surrounded by so much, so much poverty in our background and amongst us. And craft makers are no different. And my vision is to change that and to make a change for the people who do craft. So, really, the problem is, how do we provide the makers, the makers of craft, with an equitable share of the final selling price? And we want to develop a sustainable business model. When I talk about sustainability, while well, sustainability is one of the key things, um, what I mean is sustainability of a business, a long-term business, and how it can actually work. So what are the issues that are causing this problem? Well, as we all know, it is older people who are the craft makers. They're the ones that just do craft every single day. And the young people, they're not there, because guess what? The kids want to earn a living. Like anybody else, they want to do better with their lives. And that's, that's one of the fundamental drivers that's driving them away. And often, with, see, my research is based in Sri Lanka, and what I see is a lot of young people wanting to go into towns, wanting even to be maids in different countries, and they leave their families behind. And, and the sadness that it causes, the disruption in families that it causes is absolutely immense. I want to make a change in terms of that. Sorry. I don't know. This keeps changing a bit. Let's see if we can do it. There you go. So, um, we also know the time and effort that it takes does not equal the financial benefit that they get. So, that's key. And speaking to craft makers right across the country, it's also evident that um, they use rudimentary tools and the tools are not fit for purpose and how they do things is just not fit for purpose to make it, um, make it effective enough and fast enough for what they do. And sourcing of raw, quality raw materials is also a huge issue and so is the getting it at the right price because they can't afford to buy bulk. And in between all of this, what is instantly evident is that the power of the intermediary is absolutely huge. Unlike fashion retail, where the retailer will go directly to the manufacturer, that doesn't happen in craft. There's a massive chain, and we'll see that very shortly. And also, they don't have access to the financial capital. They don't have the opportunity or the financial resources to make themselves grow. And ultimately, we've talked about this, that limited understanding of the consumer and who that end consumer is, and that's another issue. And what's the saddest thing for me, if I see, is their low ambition. They don't have a big ambition for themselves. They see it as a way to getting a bed, getting something for the house. It is not an ambition to grow and be an entrepreneur. That is not part of what they do. And ultimately, the impact has been we're diluting the quality of craft generation to generation. So as part of this, um, we, we recognize there are lots of people trying to go, do good. We all are. That's why we're here today. But fair trade and the idea of fair trade is just not living up to expectations. And the idea of a living wage 
A living wage is insufficient. A living wage will get you beyond where you are today. And they want to succeed and they want to do really well. And the other question we have to ask is our view of craft. And what, not traditional craft, but heritage craft. How do we sustain those heritage crafts and not just something we're making? You know, we want to make sure those crafts are alive for tomorrow for our children and for our children's children. And the saddest thing of all that I've recognized through this research is the idea of handicraft and how we can call handicraft something so cheap and soon as they become an artisan and a respected artisan, the value goes up immensely and we've got to stop using the word handicraft. And often that is a word they use in the Sri Lankan arena, whilst they might not use it so much over here and elsewhere. And we want to protect those crafts in that process. Ultimately, there are so many people trying to go, do good, and there are NGOs and IGOs with the UN, and I've worked with UN projects, I've seen what they actually do. But they do things, they set things up, they write a lovely report on it, and they move on. So that continuity, that sustainability simply isn't there. So well, there's a route that needs to be found and a route to, solution, to a solution to this. And ultimately, my belief is it's about commercializing craft. If we can't make it attainable for everybody out there, then really we're not going to have the opportunity to sell these wonderful items and make these people more wealthy than they are today. So we need to start seeing craft as a business and recognizing in that process the maker, the first person who uses their hands as the artisan and put value, and not just value and respect, but value, financially value, in their hands. And part of that is providing that finance. And my research goes on now to look at ways of microfinancing. How do we support these people in this process? and recognize their strengths, but also recognize they're not businessmen, they're not entrepreneurs. How can we actually create a model to support them in this journey? How can we use our skills of entrepreneurship and business to support them in this process so they're doing what's right for them and works for them, but we're taking that pressure off them? Come on. There you go. So this is the craft value creation model as, um, as we have created it. And when I say we, I've got to also introduce my colleague, um, Victoria Escadale, and she's going to present after me. And hopefully you'll start to see the link in terms of what I'm presenting to you today and what she is doing as part of this. So in terms of the craft value creation model, this is what we're recommending. And it goes beyond this, but hopefully you can see here where the foundations of all of this lies. So this is the product journey. This is the journey that our craft goes through. And in there is a designer, which I never really thought of as needing to be there. But it goes from the raw material to the maker to the product, then the intermediary, then the product goes on to the wholesaler, then the wholesaler to the retailer, and retailer to the end consumer. Now, in that process, you're increasing the price and the cost. And the end retailer will make money on this. But ultimately, that real value is created where? With the maker. And we need to ensure that that's represented. So in there, we need to increase the value creation and really look at how we innovate, not only in terms of product, but in terms of business process design. Just to give you an indication of what we're looking at, it's quality of sourcing, um, quality of raw materials, um, and in terms of the product itself, product speed, design, its quality, its usability, durability, feasibility. And that is Victoria's arena, and hopefully she'll talk to you more about that. Um, you're going a bit fast, huh? <laughs> Slow down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hold on. And, and ultimately, as part of that, we're also looking at how that retail system works, that, that business structure, that sourcing strategy from retail models to, to managing returns. Because that's one of those things. When you look at commercializing this globally, when you buy something and you know something comes from Sri Lanka or India, if it's not right, how the heck do I return this item? How do I get it back? 
So all of this has to be considered. So there's supply chain issues, return issues, and understanding and responding to the customer journey. And in terms of doing that, now you can do it. <laughs> okay, design value creation we need to look at. We also need to look at business value creation. And we've kind of broken it down into two areas. And that is developing creative artisanship models by education and providing finance and uh, providing them the tools to do so. And then also developing business models. And that gives them the real return on investment and time. Real return on investment and time. Increased demand and resilience. And resilience is key because we need to understand how we curate these items and actually make it work. Now, my, my background is also in, in, in e-commerce. So the idea is being developed around developing e-commerce platforms and really giving opportunity for us to manage that, but the artisan to do what they're good at. So watch this space. Hopefully we can create something that's going to work for the future. Thank you.